Uh, call to order our uh, rescheduled, rescheduled regular meeting of the Beverly City Council, September 28th, 2021. Ms. Dixon, could you please call the roll? Ames? Here. Copeland? Um, Feldman? Here. Flaherty? Here. Flowers, I, I believe she is not going to be here tonight. Uh, Maybe late. Okay. Uh, Hausman? Here. Rand? Here. Rotundo? Here. And Guanzi? Here. Council Hausman, please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and then we'll observe our moment of silence for Mr. Goodyear. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. And of course, uh, on behalf of the City Council, our condolences go out to Mr. Goodhue's family. Um, all right, let's go right to, Christine, are we good to go right to order number 173, the Beverly Salem American Legion Post 331 resolution? Sure. Would you like to read it or would you like me to? No, I'm going to read it. Okay. All right. That's okay. Just as a little bit of background, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Coach Levine. These guys right here were the first team ever from Beverly to go to the American Legion World Series. 6,000 American Legion teams around the country. Uh, these guys made it to the final eight. An incredible run. They won the states, they won the Northeast Regionals, and then we went down to North Carolina. Uh, I say we because I was fortunate to have my son on the team uh, and did pretty well down there in North Carolina. Uh, I think know that uh, the manager of the team, uh, Michael Levine, is with us tonight. Uh, and he did an incredible job. Oh, and thank you, Councilor Ames. Before I get to that, this is my first meeting, so I have to read a script because we are remote. Uh, confirming member access. Uh, as a preliminary matter, this is Paul Guancy, President of the Beverly City Council. Before we get started, I'd like to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Head nod. Thumbs up for members of the council. Thank you. Good evening. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this meeting and public hearing will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so in the following manner. It is recorded by the city of Beverly and live streamed by Bebcam on both channel and nine and via Bebcam's YouTube channel. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted and public participation in any public hearing conducted during this meeting shall be by remote means only. Accordingly, please be aware that other participants or viewers may be able to see and hear you, and anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. You have the option to turn off your video if you're participating via computer. All participants should keep their microphones or phones muted unless recognized by me to reduce background noise and feedback. Please wait until the person speaking is finished before speaking so we can clearly hear all participants. In addition, because of the rural meeting, I'm going to read Rule 22 of the Rules and Regulations of the Beverly City Council. Rule 22, all subcommittees of the council shall cause records to be kept of their proceedings. They shall report by ordinance, order, or resolve unless otherwise provided by law. No subcommittee shall act by separate consultation and no report of as a body shall be received unless agreed in subcommittee actually notified and assembled for the purpose in hand and signed by a majority of the councilors of the subcommittee. Every subcommittee to which any subject matter may be referred shall report thereon as soon as possible after full consideration thereof and a vote thereon. However, if the council may by majority vote order any matter pending before subcommittee to be acted upon the subcommittee at its next meeting and or to be forthwith returned to the full council. All that means for anybody that hasn't been here before is rather than refer things to committee, we vote them as the committee of the whole on the floor as long as the majority of my colleagues agree with that. So we'll take a roll call vote as to whether we're going to do that or not. Ms. Dixon, can you do that? Sure. Uh, Ames? 
Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Hausman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guangxi? Yes, so we will vote everything out on the floor. Uh, we do have one public hearing tonight, so let me go over the ground rules. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will invite the council to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. You may mute yourself or be muted by the meeting host by clicking the microphone mute slash unmute icon, pressing the mute button on your telephone, or by pressing number six on your telephone keypad. Uh, please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. After councils have asked their questions, then we'll go to members of the public. Councillor Copeland has a question. Uh, no, I do not have a question. That shouldn't be up. I'm trying to get my camera to work. <laughs> no worries. I know we want to see you. Thank you. Um, okay. I apologize for once again forgetting to read the script. You only have to deal with me six more times. Um, so we're back to the um, Beverly Salem American Legion Post 331. It was an incredible summer, and I know we have a couple of people other than the city council that would like to recognize them. So first, I would like to go to our state representative, Jerry Paracella. Rep. Paracella. Thank you very much, Council President. I really appreciate it. Um, just wanted to take a brief moment to uh, recognize the accomplishments of the Beverly Salem Legion team. As you mentioned, it's a historic season. They went further than any other team in the team's history. So it was quite an amazing season. The kids uh, really did a great job. There they are representing uh, Beverly and Salem. And uh, Coach Levine and his staff uh, just did a terrific job. So I too have a resolution. I won't read it all. But what I would like to uh, just read a couple lines from this resolution, which was passed by the uh, Massachusetts House. So it's permanently in the records of the Massachusetts House of Representatives. And I'll just read a couple of lines because I don't want to go through all the whereases, but it does uh, just in general, it does talk about the accomplishments of the team. So I would say, whereas it is fitting on this occasion that the Commonwealth recognize the contributions of the Beverly Salem Legion baseball team to the city of Beverly and Salem and its citizens, therefore, be it resolved that the Massachusetts House of Representatives proudly extends its well wishes for continued success and congratulations to the players, of the Beverly Salem Legion baseball team, the coaching staff and support personnel on their road to the World Series. So this resolution is an official record of the Massachusetts House of Representatives. I really wanna congratulate the teams, especially the uh, players, the older players who uh, missed their senior year and have high school ball and got to play in this tournament. Uh, it was a terrific accomplishment by all of you. And we look forward to inviting you to the uh, State House later on this year. So thank you very much, Mr. President. Great job, Rep. Thank you. And next we have somebody from Senator Joan Lovely's office. That would be Who's... Senator, that would be Senator Joan. Oh, Dynamite. <laughs> I saw the phone come up as lovely office and it is a lovely office, but uh, good to have you here, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President and members of the City Council. It is an honor to be here tonight to recognize this really terrific team. And uh, I too have a resolution that was passed in the Senate. And I'm just gonna read the first and last paragraphs. Uh, Whereas the Beverly Salem Legion Post 331 baseball team advanced to the American Legion World Series in Shelby, North Carolina, after securing its first state title since 1976, by beating the Milton Legion Post 114 baseball team on July 28, 2021, and going further than any team from the Commonwealth has ever gone in the American Legion World Series, and be it resolved that a copy of these resolutions be transmitted forthwith by the clerk of the Senate to the Beverly Sound Legion Post 331 baseball team. We also in the Senate, and I believe in the House as well, have uh, passed official citations for all of the coaches and for all of the... Uh, oh teammates and i'd like to just i'm not gonna i'm just gonna read uh, the language uh, the citations are in recognition of winning the massachusetts state title and northeast regionals and bring great pride to your community and these are i'm going to read the coaches and players if you let me 
Uh, coaches Eric Levine, Matt Levine, manager Michael Levine, Kevin McGrath, and Zach Levine, and players Braden Clark, Nick McIntyre, Will Foglietta, Matt Plose, Noah Guanci, Austin Foglietta, Eric DePiro, Josh Demers, Brennan Frost, Tyler Petrozino, Logan Petrozino, Cooper G Gavin, Nick Fox, Christian Morrissey, Lee Pacheco, Jacob Novus, and Jake Miano. So very pleased to be able to be here tonight to recognize this great team and their coaches and their families. And a hearty congratulations for Ms. Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Always great to see you. Keep up the good work. Same with you, Council, um, Representative Paracella. Thank you. Thank you Tip, for taking time out uh, of your busy schedules to be here. I know how things can get crazy at the State House, but um, I'm sure the guys appreciate you being here. Um, okay, we have a resolution from the City Council, and I'm going to read the whole thing because I was fortunate enough to um, get to know these boys, and they're an incredible group of kids, uh, young adults. Well, some of them are kids, and some are young adults, and uh, the dedication that the coaching staff put in was amazing. They just did a, they did a wonderful job, and they made everybody's summer this year in Beverly. Everybody seemed to be following them. Um, so I have a resolution. Beverly Salem, American Legion Post 331. Whereas Beverly Salem, American Legion Post 331 recently competed, completed a tremendous baseball season that included a state title, a Northeast Regional Championship, and a trip to the American Legion World Series in beautiful Shelby, North Carolina. Whereas the team was coached by Eric Levine, Matthew Levine, and Kevin McGrath, Mike Levine served, uh, and I met Jake Levine also. Mike Levine served as the team's manager and field general. Manager Be Levine believed early on that he had a core group of veteran players who could lead this squad to the postseason. Whereas post 331 went 5-0 in the state tournament in Quincy and then went 4-1 in the Northeast Regional Tournament in Worcester to earn a trip to North Carolina. This group of ball players was the first team ever to qualify for a World Series at any level in Beverly. Whereas Tyler Petrozino was named most valuable player in the state tournament. He led post 331 through all three rounds of the postseason with his timely hitting, solid outfield defense, and his outstanding leadership qualities, and of course, his over-the-top enthusiasm. Whereas Braden Clark served as the team's ace on the mound, notching two wins in the state tournament, and provided a gutsy outing against Newport, Rhode Island in the Northeast Regional Tournament. Moving to second base after reaching his pitch count, Braden played solid defense and drove in the winning run with a deep drive to the wall and left, sending post 331 south to North Carolina. I just got the chills on that one. Whereas Matt Plose served as the team's number one catcher and leader on the field. Matt was solid at the plate throughout the playoffs and made it his job to get on base any way he could. An unmovable force in the batter's box, Matt was hit by a pitch three times in one game during the World, World Series play. Whereas Nick McIntyre played great defense all summer and into the playoffs. His speed and base running skills kept opposing pitchers and catchers guessing every time he was present on the base paths. Nick also pitched in relief and shut down a solid squad from Newport, Rhode Island to set the stage for Braden Clark's game-winning blast. Whereas Will Foglietta served as the team's designated hitter and backup catcher throughout the postseason. He was an offensive force at the plate and was rewarded with a spot on the 2021 American Legion World Series All-Tournament Team. His constant focus and intensity was quick to rub off on his younger teammates. Whereas Austin Foglietta played flawless defense every postseason game in left field. He came up big in clutch situations by getting on base and driving in critical runs. He and his brother Will kept things loose in the dugout and made sure that everyone supported each other when they were at the plate. Whereas Lee Pachenko joined the team in 2021 and instantly became an impact player. Lee played solid defense at third base and served as the team's cleanup hitter. He pounded opposing pitching pitchers while driving in crucial runs in Quincy, Worcester, and in Shelby. Whereas Jake Miano became a top line starting pitcher during the regular season with his commanding presence on the mound. After getting injured in the second game of the state tournament, Jake remained the loudest voice in the dugout, encouraging his teammates to do their best. 
Jake was able to return to action in the World Series, pitching well against the tough Michigan team to keep post 331 in the game. Whereas Brennan Frost led the team in hitting, played great defense in right field, and did an outstanding job on the mound in relief against Natick in game two of the state tournament. Manager Mike Levine called Frost the team's unsung hero. Brennan's bat was on fire during the team's run in North Carolina, and he was also named to the American Legion World Series All-Tournament team. Whereas Nick Fox grew exponentially as a player from the previous summer. A natural leader, Nick constantly cheered on, cheered on his teammates and made every one of his at-bats count. Nick had a number of important hits in each round of the playoffs and scored the winning run in the regional tournament against Newport, Rhode Island, that sent post-331 to Shelby, North Carolina. Whereas Cooper Hat Gavin was hurt during the regular season, but he worked hard during his rehab to be able to join his teammates for their postseason run. Co Cooper got his chance in the Northeast Regional Tournament against Shrewsbury and came up huge. Coop pitched six solid innings for the win to keep post-331 in the winner's bracket. Cooper also got the starting nod against Idaho in the World Series, but a long rain delay got in the way of another solid outing by Coop. Whereas post-331 veteran Eric DiPiero pitched tremendous during the regular season and continued to do so in the playoffs. Eric was 3-0 during Beverly Salem's postseason run. He shut down a powerful Lemonster team 11-0 in the state tournament, was masterful in a 1-0 win against New York in the Northeast Regional Tournament, and started and got the win in Beverly Salem's lone World Series victory against Iowa. Whereas Logan Petrozino was one of the team's youngest players and played solid defense at second base and was a constant presence on the base paths via hit or walk. Logan's bat was especially on fire during the state tournament in Quincy. He recorded a four-hit game against Lemonster. Whereas Noah Guansi, the team's youngest player, and usually known for his solid outfield defense, provided an offensive spark against a strong native club during the state tournament with two clutch hits and a couple of runs batted in. They were also took the mound admirably when called upon, making four postseason post appearances, including two in the World Series. Whereas Christian Morrissey served as a role player during the season and was called upon to come out of the bullpen in the Northeast Regional Tournament and the World Series. The right-handed flamethrower kept opposing hitters on their toes and was always the first one to race out of the dugout to warm up his teammates. Whereas Jacob Novus always remained ready to help out his team and his teammates. During the regular season, he had an outstanding game against Andover. Jake Jacob came off the bench and drove a pinch hit single to left field against Bangor, Maine in the Northeast Regional Tournament. His hit started a big inning that sealed post 331's victory in their first game in Worcester. Whereas Josh Demers is a special ball player and with unmatched love for the game of baseball. Josh saw action at second base, third base, and stayed loose in case he was needed on the mound. Josh had a base hit and a run scored in Beverly Salem's big inning against Bangor, Maine. That's all 17 of them, and all 17 of them uh, did a wonderful job. Therefore, now therefore, the mayor and the city council of the city of Beverly does hereby honor this championship team of the Salem Beverly American Legion Post 331. We wish them good luck and success in their futures and thank them for a great season and hereby order the city clerk spread a copy of this resolution upon city records. Congratulations, boys. Uh, would anybody from the coaching staff like to make uh, make a comment? Mike Levine has his hand raised. Yeah, I guess my microphone is better than uh, what my boss tells me. Okay. <laughs> I really appreciate this, uh, both uh, the state and um, with Terry and with Joan. I appreciate the uh, the honors you guys have uh, bestowed upon the team. Uh, Paul, uh, thank you for putting this all together uh, with Michael and, and the city council members. Uh, as you said at the beginning, this is definitely a special team. It was a special summer, and um, you know, I'm very proud of these young men and what they accomplished and what they were able to do um, in such a short time period. Uh, you know, I'm still recovering from it, <laughs> you know, a month later. So it's uh, I, I really appreciate everything you guys have bestowed upon us. 
we uh, are having a banquet in November, and uh, I welcome this, the city council. If you'd like to come, you're very much welcome to uh, to join us, uh, since you'll be cooking, Paul. <laughs> uh, so I, again, I appreciate it. Uh, the team appreciates it, and uh, hopefully, we can put something together for uh, for next year's run. Thanks, Coach. I know Coach Kevin McGrath is on the call. Uh, Coach McGrath, do you have anything to add? Just uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I'll never forget this summer. Uh, special, special group of kids. And a uh, an absolute blast work with Mike and his whole other family coaching. Um, I'll never forget it. And I'm looking forward to going back there again. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Coach. Uh, Mayor Cahill, I know that you and Mayor Driscoll sent a nice letter to the boys. Do you have anything to add? Sure. Thanks, Mr. President. So, wow. Um, let me first just say to, to Manager Mike Levine, my Little League teammate from the Patty Construction Red Sox, it's great to see you and, and, and have you do so well with this team. And Coach Kevin McGrath, who's not as old as Mike and me, but I've known him a long time and love him. I'm, I really... I'm happy for you guys as leaders of the team. To you, young men, um, I think a lot of us, a lot of us know that experience as players and coaches of, of postseason runs at the local, the state level. You did it at the regional and national level. That's just amazing. Um, I know you loved it. I know you had a blast, and and I'm really happy for you. I see some of your parents. I know they're bursting and 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 really proud of you. And and it's just a wonderful feeling to be uh to be in the in the in the meeting here looking at all these great faces um i don't want to single anybody out except to say that eric tapiro since eric's mom works at the at the council on aging and and she's here and so is our council on aging director marianne holak eric was interning this summer at the council on aging so a lot of beverly seniors were tuned in and really hanging on every pitch uh during your run and that was fun for all of them and, and us as well but listen fantastic to see you do so well you made the whole both of our communities incredibly proud um and and congratulations and enjoy thank you mayor kale always well said uh any members of the council with a quick remark before we move on really that never happens guys um and coach levine did say that we uh, the boys are having a banquet in November when some of the older kids are back from college. Uh, we have a nice copy for all of the kids. Uh, I can't lift my shoulder up. Sorry, guys. Uh, we have a nice one of these to present to every one of the coaches and the kids uh, at the banquet, Coach. So we look forward to it when you nail down a date, and we'll go from there. And hats off to the uh, city of Shelby, North Carolina. It's amazing how they rolled out the red carpet for these boys and they were treated like uh celebrities or rock stars uh everybody from the eight teams there but i i think that the community really uh, developed a special bond with the kids from beverly because we were the nicest group of guys right so i would entertain a motion to for the council to approve the resolution so moved so moved. second and a roll call ames yes copeland Yes. Feldman? Absolutely. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Hausman? A terrific yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanti? And yes. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. You're not required, those of you that were here for the resolution, you're not required to stay for the rest of the meeting, but if you want to, we'd love to have you. Thank you. Okay, if we were in council chambers now, we would take a five minute recess to congratulate the boys, but we're not. So we will go move on right to our agenda. We have a public hearing scheduled for 745. So before that, let's take care of some business. Um, I would entertain a motion to accept the minutes of our meeting that was held on September 13th, 2021. So moved. Second. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. 
Feldman? Yes. Fla uh, Flaherty? Yes. Flowers, Hausman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. Guanci? I am a yes. Let's go to communications from his honor, the mayor, Ms. Dixon. Okay. So I have number 165. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Dear Honorable City Council, I am pleased to inform you that the City of Beverly has been awarded two grants from the Massachusetts Seaport Economic Council. $656,000 has been awarded to support the reconstruction of the commercial hoist and fishing pier at Glover Wharf. Also, $62,400 has been awarded to conduct a feasibility study for recreational and transient floats in Beverly Harbor. Along with requesting the approval of this grant, I am also requesting approval to transfer 71,840 from the Harbor Management Fund, along with the transfer of 71,840 from the Reserve for Unforeseen. The combined transfer value of $143,680 will represent the required 20% match. The transfer component of this request will necessitate a public hearing prior to any final action by the City Council. These grant awards will facilitate the repair and reconstruction of the commercial fishing pier and help determine whether floating docks are viable for transient moorage and for staging areas for local individuals or charters loading and unloading gear and passengers. I respectfully ask that the City Council take action on this combined request by setting a public hearing at your meeting on Tuesday, September 28th, 2021. Thank you. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Um... Is Catherine Barrett here, our grant director? Yes, I am. Thank you, Council President. Ms. Barrett. Um, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to um, thank the team, the t extended team that worked on these two grants. Um, and that is Sean Ciancarelli, uh, Paul Earl, and Don Newman, and um, myself. We were a, a, a team that worked on both of these grants. We're one of only two communities in Massachusetts that were awarded two grants from the Seaport Economic Council. Um, we actually did just get some news from the Lieutenant Governor today that we got an extra $600 added to the Hoist and Commercial Fishing Pier grant. So the total for the um, that grant is $656,000 and 600. <laughs> So it's always good to get news that you have more grant money than you thought, but that means the match uh, will be adjusted slightly. So I'm not sure if I need to do an addendum communication for the mayor to send to the council or if that can be um, amended in, uh, during the meeting and voted on. Uh, the match will, the transfer will be 71,900 and the combined transfer is 140,000 $143,800, so slightly, uh, a little bit more due to the extra money that we, we learned about today. Uh, any questions for Ms. Barrett? Um, and I know Paul, if nobody has any questions, I'll go to Paul Earl from the uh, Harbor Management Authority is here. It looks like Mr. Councilor Earl. Copeland. Oh, oh. Yeah. Councilor Copeland, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, just a quick question, and you might deal with this actually at the hearing, but as far as those uh, those two accounts, the Harbor Management Fund, um, when we take money from those funds, do, do we know how much will be still left in those funds? Or, Yep. Okay. Yeah, so I'll defer, defer to our chairman of the Harbor Management Authority, Paul Earl, and he's on the call with us, and he was instrumental in helping us um, obtain these grants a lot, along with Don Newman, who's also a member of the Harbor Management Authority. Perfect. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Councilor Houseman. Oh. And then we'll go to Mr. Earl. That's fine. Uh, yes, Mr. President, I, I just want to uh, congratulate the, the leadership team uh, that, that worked on, on getting these grants. Um, I know when I was liaison with the Harbor Management Authority, I think at least six years ago, maybe eight years ago, uh, both of these items were very much topics of discussion, very much uh, uh, long-term goals. I know these have been worked on for a really long time. And so I just want to acknowledge the leadership of, um, uh, of the team uh, and its chair, uh, Paul Earl, 
uh, and everyone who worked on this. Uh, so congratulations. Really looking forward to this uh, this happening. Thank you. Thank you, Council Houseman. Mr. Earl. Okay. Good evening, Council President and members and members of the public that are still with us. Um, Harbor Management Authority is very pleased to support the projects funded by the grants and especially give thanks to the Seaport Economic Council for awarding both. Um, we work with the city and consultants in a very seamless way in preparing the applications. Uh, I think the fact that it was so seamless was really uh, all due to Catherine Barrett, who really managed the process well, gave deadlines, got stuff out quickly for review, and uh, got the applications in on time. So, Catherine, thank you very much. Uh, both projects, both the new commercial hoist pier and the feasibility study for increasing, let's just call it float and mooring capacity in the um, Glover Wharf area, are included and referenced in the city's 2019 harbor plan and in the 2021 master plan. So these have been vetted by the council in some cases before. They've been researched thoroughly over the years, as uh, Scott was mentioning, and um, we're really very happy to see them come to fruition uh, to help Beverly now as well as in the future. The they support the vibrant and hopefully will help sustain the commercial fishing industry in Beverly, which currently has about 20 commercial boats at the marina um, that actually go out and fish. There's a waiting list of nine, uh, which is really good for the future of fishing. Um, they represent a net to, to their haul that comes in of about 4 million, represent about 800,000 pounds of fish and uh, lobster and uh, tuna that they catch during a typical year. And it's an important industry. And to me, who lived here 42 years now, uh, a really nice aspect of the city. So uh, that grant's going to help sustain it because the current hoist pier is a needed replacement, okay, for sure. Uh, the feasibility study is something that I'm excited about. Um, that's a very tight area down there. We all know that. So we need to be careful what we do. But at the same time, I don't think we're in a position to rule out options at this point in order to increase commerce to the local businesses that arrives by water, okay? And if we can provide some ways to allow people to stop by and visit Beverly uh, by water, uh, visit our new restaurant, which uh, hopefully will be open in May. I know Mr. Bloom still plans that. <clears throat> and um, those folks, I think when it's not boating season, might come back to Beverly and spend more money. So I think having that kind of capability available down there is very important it's tight space. We don't have enough. I really wish we could expand either to the right or to the left. But right now, that's that's kind of like not in the cards. So, uh, you know, we'll see how that goes. Uh, as mentioned, uh, HMA is providing half of the matching funds for this project from our capital account as financial support for the projects. And to answer Mr. Copeland's uh, question, um, if it turns out to be, let's just use 70,000 as a rough number that we contribute, uh, that will reduce our current capital fund of 440,000 by 70, we'll, we'll be at um, 370. Uh, so we're still, uh, we make money. I think some of you know this. I was with the council a few months ago, but just briefly, we make money by running the marinas for the city. We, we pay for the, uh, for Sean, who's the part-time marina manager and we pay for all the other operating expenses but we take in close to two hundred thousand dollars a year and we can keep really good service and keep everybody happy and only really spend about a hundred so we can put a hundred into this fund to then reinvest as matching or if you look at all the kayak racks around the city now we, we've paid for all those and this is all non this is all non-taxpayer dollars so i think it really hopefully helps the city in terms of doing some stuff that perhaps we wouldn't be able to do as much so 
I thank the council and the city for their support of what HMA does. And um, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Earl. Any other members of the city council? Uh, I am going to ask our finance director, Brian Ailes, and Mike, Michael Cahill has, I don't know who to refer to first, obviously the mayor, Mayor Cahill. <laughs> you better call Mr. Ailes first. Okay. Thanks. Mr. Ailes, you're the finance guy. Break Hello. it down. How are we going to do this? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I just wanted to uh, make sure um, that if the council were to take action this evening to set a public hearing, that it reflects the amended amounts that Ms. Barrett noted. Um, we want to make sure that that's the amount that gets acted on by the council, um, as opposed to the original communications. And uh, Ms. Dixon, I, I can work with your team on this as well. We want to make sure that the amended amounts are what's advertised in the public hearing so that we follow the steps of the law. Um, that's the only point I had to make, unless there's okay. And, Ms. Questions. and Mr. Rails, we should do this all together. On I, it looks like our public hearing would be on the 18th of October, as opposed to trying to accept the grant now and then have the public hearing for the transfer. Yeah, I think for, it, for keys, it would probably be easiest just to do it all at once. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, Mayor Cahill. Thanks, Mr. President. I don't want to repeat. I think that that both Ms. Barrett and then Mr. Earl spoke really well. I I want to say how appreciative we are of Mr. Earl's leadership on the Harbor Management Authority and the whole team over there. Um, and, and, and wholeheartedly, a lot of great things going on and, and have for a number of years. Um, and then the only other thing I wanna say, because I think we otherwise are missing an opportunity, um, Commissioner Collins actually got to vote on these grants, didn't he? Ms. Barrett, wasn't it his first meeting? Several months ago, the Lieutenant Governor called and asked us if we wanted to have a representative on the Seaport Council from the City of Beverly. And so uh, Commissioner Collins is now serving on the Council. It's actually a real honor. Uh, I think these grants would have been approved anyway because they were so incredibly well uh, prepared and, and very needed and worthwhile efforts. But it's nice to have Commissioner Collins now sitting at the table on a regular basis with the State Seaport Council. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Cahill. As if um, Commissioner Collins doesn't have enough to do, he's pretty amazing. Good stuff. And I just want to say one one more thing about Paul Earl while he's here. Uh, congrats on a successful Harbor Fest last week at Lynch Park. Uh, that event wouldn't have happened without all your hard work and your volunteers. So thank you on that also. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, so I would entertain a motion to set a public hearing for uh, Monday, October 18th, 20, uh, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. So moved. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Hausman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanti. Yes. Thank you, Mr. everyone. Mr. President? Yes, Councilor Houseman. Yeah, I don't know. Do we need, uh, I guess I defer to you and, and, and Mr. Ailes, do we need to uh, state uh, for the record that the, uh, the uh, increased amount is this, will be the subject of the public hearing? I think for, for clarity of, of the record, I, I think it's a good point, Mr. Houseman. Counselor. Okay. Um, in in that case, let me let me take a, a swing at this, Mr. President. Of course. Uh, I, I make a motion that the public hearing uh, to hear order 100, uh, 165 uh, be a public hearing to accept a grant in the amount of six hundred fifty six thousand and six hundred dollars. Uh, second to Council Houseman's amended order. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Hausman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. Quancy? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, especially Council Hausman. Uh, okay, we are at our public hearing uh, at 7.45 p.m., order number 161. Ms. Dixon, could you please read that order? Or oh, you want me to? I don't mind. I can do it. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay.
you want me to read the full thing or just the summary? Just the summary. Okay, great. Um, this is a Mass DOT order number 161, Mass DOT petition of the MBTA for communication conduit location plan number 321823F on Cabot Street. And is somebody here from the Mass Department of uh, Transportation uh, to talk about this one? Uh, yes, uh, Council oh, President. Right. Uh, my name is Jaime Garmendia. I'm uh, project manager for this project at the MBTA. And just uh, give us a heads up as to what you would like to do. Sure. Um, we actually have a, a slide. I have a member of my staff uh, here as well to present, if that's uh, okay for the council. No, that's great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, Ibrahim, can you present that? There's a present now button on the uh, Google Meet. Sure. This is great. Utility companies never have, uh, have slides for us. <laughs> we try to be a little a little more prepared than that. No, that's dynamite. Thank you. All right. So this is a um, Google Earth map um, of the affected area. Um, as you can see, um, this is at the uh, northern end of the Veterans Memorial Bridge. Um, we are uh, we the MBTA are putting in a, a buried fiber optic network all over the commuter rail. Um, and in this stretch, in order to get across the Danvers River, uh, rather than going underwater and interrupting all the boat traffic, um, uh, we are uh, working with MassDOT to attach our conduit to the uh, side of the, of the Route 1A bridge. Um, but that means we need to uh, cross some city streets to get back to the right of way. Um, and as you can sh uh, see on this map, the, uh, the kind of reddish purple line there uh, is where we anticipate uh, putting in our conduit below city streets. Um, uh, this conduit will carry, like I said, fiber optic communications cable, um, and it'll go from the abutment of the Veterans Memorial Bridge down to Cabot Street, um, up to uh, the Congress Street intersection, um, down Ellenwood Court, about half a block, and then crossing an MBTA-owned parcel on the edge of the right away to get back to the tracks. And the um, the yellow area, uh, as you can see here, that is the uh, the abutters uh, list that we developed is is uh, all properties that are within that um, that yellow area on the map. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ward two project. Any any questions from members of the city council? Mm -hmm. Council Rand, anything? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I was typing me and okay. um, it was taking a minute. So can you um, can you just clarify for me because there this 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 project is related to the regional transportation um, national grid project or it's completely separate or will you just help me with that? Sure. It's uh, it's actually completely separate. OK, got mm -hmm. it. Yeah, so this uh, we uh, met with uh, Mayor Cahill and his staff, um, I guess, uh, several weeks ago at this point, it was probably July, um, to kind of go over the details. Uh, but for your benefit, um, what we are doing is uh, putting in communications fiber on the MBTA tracks um, all over the commuter rail network for uh, MBTA uses. Um, so we're talking about signal systems, um, you know, uh, uh, potentially passenger communication systems. Uh, all on, on the buried fiber network. Through this area right now, it's all on aerial pole lines. Um, and uh, that turns out not to be so resilient in winter um, with tree fall. Um, and so we are trying to get that underground yeah. at this point. If, if I may, I have a couple follow-up questions. Of course, Councilor Rand. Thank you. So, and can you also just walk me through, is this connected at all to the, um, the project from, I don't know, maybe it was two years ago where there was an upgrade to all of the communication systems for the MBTA? Um, I'm not sure I'm familiar with which project you're referring to. Um, it's like I, a signaling. Yes, if it was, uh, so we had a couple of projects that are kind of all interrelated. Um, positive train control might be the one you're thinking of. Yes, thank um, you. Yes, yeah, so that is uh, a railroad essential safety system required by the federal government. Um, we have successfully installed that everywhere. That was operational as of last August 2020 uh, across the entire uh, MBTA network. Um, there is, uh, so the federal government 
um, said, okay, PTC works best with a, a, an upgraded <laughs> signal system, which we are installing currently on uh, all the north side lines. So we've been doing a lot of work uh, up uh, you know, on the Gloucester branch uh, most recently, and we'll be getting to the uh, main new report line um, next year. Uh, so that's uh, upgrading the base signal system, which PTC is a safety system on top of. Um, all of that runs on the aerial fiber. Okay, thank you. And then um, what else will be, um, what else will this cable be used for? What type of communications? Is it just kind of working with that signaling? Is it within the, you know, within the, the train itself? Um, so yes, it is all going to be, right now the, the uh, intended purpose is MBTA vital communications. So safety systems, signal systems, uh, things that need to be protected um, and are really bad if you get interrupted. Um, okay. So there will be excess capacity um, that we hope to use for other like passenger related purposes um, in the future. Um, and uh, we are also pursuing uh, uh, on a side course, um, we're looking for funding for to install commercial fiber um, that is, uh, you know, dark fiber to be leased to third parties. Um, that is not a funded project at, at this time, but if we get the money for that, then we'll be installing it at the same time. Okay. And so there are there. Um... Are there any, this may not be a question for you, but I'm, I'm curious about any regulations on um, installing, um, you know, fiber optic communication cables and then basically, you know, selling that, that uh, service beyond what you're using it for. Is that something um, within our city? Is that something that the city regulates or is that, um, it's a state asset, um, so it's regulated at the state level. Got um, it. So there's no 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 profit that you'll be make that the state makes from that that comes back to the city. Uh, I'm not aware of any at this time. But uh, again, that that uh, that is a secondary project that uh, if we get funding for, we'll be back to talk about. Yeah, that that would be interesting to see how that goes, and just to sort of dive into that type of fiber optic cabling. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like, yeah, I think a lot of people in the city would like to explore that a little. Oh, Who would I talk to about understanding better the um, sort of the profit from that potential project? Um, so it's we've done some preliminary stuff, uh, some uh, some financial research. Uh, look what the market is like. Um, uh, it's kind of hard to, to answer the question about with, with uh, real numbers because it's all kind of fictional until we sign up a, a partner. Right. Um, but we will be looking more closely at that going forward. Um, the MBTA is uh, preparing a procurement for a commercialization partner uh, to look for those funds and determine kind of what the profit margin would be in that activity. Um, I can follow up with you by email, try to get you the right point of contact with the MBTA. Perfect. And my last question, um, Council President, through you, again, is just what kind of disruption can we expect in that neighborhood for construction? Um, so uh, we are in the middle of hiring our contractor to form this work. It will be a design build project. So um, uh, there are a couple of options. Uh, our preferred approach and the one that we have taken to about 30 percent design um, is uh, directional drilling. So we would dig a, a trench pit, you know, on one end and the trench pit on the other, and then use a, a drill to connect the dots um, without disrupting the surface of the street. That is more ex a more expensive option, and it is ultimately the decision of our contracting partner to to do what is uh, uh, the most cost effective uh, approach. Uh, the other approach would be to open up the road and do a trench, this you know, kind of the more traditional utility way. And it depends what's in the road there which we uh, will need to be mapping out um, with National Grid, with the city, you know, just to make sure that there aren't too many obstructions. Um, so if there's a lot of stuff in the ground, trenching is probably the best route. Um, uh, you know, uh, if, if it's pretty, a pretty clear path, directional drilling you know, is you know, a more painless option for the city. Um, you know, we're also uh, working with 
near Cahill with that the lot that we are where we are snagging the left to get back to the right of way. Um, you know, the city is working on leasing that from the MBTA uh, for your waterfront uh, parking lot. And so we were, we need to coordinate with the city to make sure that everything happens without too much disruption. So we'll be working with the, the mayor and his staff on that very closely. Great. And actually, I, I believe I'm in on that a butters list. So hopefully, I mean, if I'm not, I'm sure you could add me to that, but it'd be great to get those notifications. I'm sure I'll make sure I know that. Ibrahim, can you uh, work with Meg to make sure that uh, Council Member Rand's on the list? Thank you. Sure. Mr. President, you mute it. I never mute. Um, <laughs> Council Rotondo and Council Houseman, I'm going to defer to the mayor first, and then we'll come back to you folks. Mayor Cahill? Thanks, Mr. President. Just, um, just to kind of build on what Jaime said, um, as, as Councilor Rand knows, you've talked with the grid team on the 115 KV project. You know that some of that work will be starting soon. Um, Given that there are a number of things going on right here, what you're in, in, in the middle of what you're seeing on the screen, we'll be working closely with Jaime and, and Ibrahim and their team. And I also see Lee here as well. Um, we want to make sure that this is timed up right. Best case scenario is they get in and out before the restaurant opens next summer because we're trying to nail down those parking spaces. Um, we also know that the three intersection project is at a place where the final work on the intersection at Cabot and Rantoul will be will be done in the spring um, and so you know there's a lot there so managing the different pieces of work there is important uh, to ensure we do well and council ran you know, we um, I think best if, if we keep talking about that make sure that we're all we're all um, briefed and on the same page as we go with with both the MBTA team uh, and and the various well we got mass dot with the three intersection project MBTA here and and national grid uh, on the other. So lots to coordinate there together. Thanks, Mr. President. Thank you, Mayor Cahill. Uh, let's go to Councilor Rotundo. Um, I think actually pretty much answered the question was is um, how long, when does the project look to be started? There is a lot going on down there. Um, so the matter of is, are you planning on staging equipment down there? I know there's been some complaints about other um, pieces of equipment staged in the parking area where there's they're taking up spaces and we know it's a very premium thing down there currently. So I think those are a couple of other things where there is a lot with the national grid, with the whole um, signalization going on as well as the restaurant. And now we have this project as well. So it just seems it's one thing after another. And I know time-wise the timeline keeps spreading out. So it's just, you did kind of touch upon that, but you also did say that you would be um, coordinating within the time frame of the other two projects. So. I think you kind of answered it. Thank you. Of course. And, we'll, and again, we'll be in touch with the mayor's office very closely uh, as we get our contractor on board and get around to finishing the design and scheduling the work. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Councilor Houseman, please. Uh, thank you. I know we're approaching 8 o'clock, so I want to uh, try to be brief. Um, I really have two questions. Uh, one is just to clarify, uh, will any of this assist the T uh, assist the MBTA in dealing with the issues that periodically crop up with the um, uh, the railroad bridge and when it goes out of service? Is this going to sort of help avoid that or simply help communications around when it happens? Uh, you mean the uh, the drawbridge? Yeah. Yes. Um, so this is uh, unrelated to the drawbridge, although um, some of the vital signals, uh, the communications will travel through this uh, pipeline. Um, so... Uh, the bridge itself, and you know, we're hopefully at the at the end of any ongoing capital work there. Um, uh, I know that they've done a bunch uh, over the past year or so to wrap up the rebuild. Um, uh, I don't anticipate uh, having come from the railroad operations side of the house uh, prior to working on capital. I don't anticipate uh, much further disruption on that bridge. Okay, thank you. And then my second question really has to do with the excess capacity you talked about for commercial purposes mm -hmm. and how that might relate directly to the city. Um, 
And sort of related to that, I guess I would ask uh, the mayor or, or you to describe what is the city directly perhaps uh, benefiting uh, from this project? Are we getting, I think uh, there was an, uh, some reference perhaps additional parking spaces that were been, that are um, on MBTA property that the city is going to have the benefit of for the restaurant. Is that accurate? And secondly, are there any other sort of direct handoff benefits that the city is getting or talking with the MBTA about getting as a result of the permission that the council gives to uh, allow this, you know, enable this project to go forward? Um, so uh, first, I just want to remind the council, this is a grant of location. Um, uh, and so it uh, really is about, you know, the utility work. Um, the parking is a separate matter um, that Mayor Kale's been working on, you know, before I've been around. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we're making sure that's advancing because we want to get that done, you know, at the same time or beforehand, right? We want to make sure that uh, the city gets use of that if, if the lease works out um, in a timely fashion. So uh, it's a matter of coordination of projects, but they're not related. Um, as for the fiber itself, uh, the vital system, like the MBTA's uh, primary goal, uh, is to stabilize and uh, provide resiliency for our, uh, you know, critical communications and safety systems. Um, so that'll be um, most beneficial. You know, in a, when we have a bad winter and a lot of trees fall and it takes down the overhead wire, right now that disrupts train service immensely, right? Not just because there are trees on the tracks, but because uh, our signal systems are down and, uh, and we have to go limited speed. You know, we, have to, we can put fewer trains through at any, you know, any given stretch. Um, so it would be really, that right now is a really disruptive occurrence. Um, with the fiber underground, um, you know, we, it'll break a lot less frequently. Um, and so that's, that's the primary goal. Uh, as for the commercial side, you know, we are, Managing it uh, mostly as a separate project, uh, you know, right? Because a separate team has to find the funding to make that a reality. It would be my job to put it in if it, the funding materializes. I will tell you straight uh, forwardly that the MBTA is very interested in partners um, on this, on the, the commercial funding aspect um, and customers for that matter. Um, so uh, it, the uh, MBTA would be, you know, interested in working with. The city of Beverly uh, in, into uh, in building out that network and making it functional. Um, but right now, again, it's we're still at the is there an interest? Is there funding for that uh, fiber before we get to the point of who can use it? Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. President, I, I know we have an eight o'clock uh, meeting, but I, uh, perhaps uh, later or uh, we could hear from the mayor on sort of the follow on uh, re responses to my questions. Thank you. I, 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 Mr. President, I, Council, I think I think Jaime answered them. I mean, the, the, we've been working with the T on the parking for a while, and this is a grant of location. This isn't a, you know, a, they give us something to get something. I, I don't, I don't think that's what we're talking about here. Well, I, I so I, could, perhaps you could just elaborate on the number of parking spaces that we're going to end up getting through the. Oh, oh, sure, uh, sure. Sorry, uh, Council. That's, that's been a very large conversation in the city. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the goal is to try to get 16 or 17 spaces in this in this space here. It's it's along the track, and it'll end up being kind of a triangular parcel. Um, so we, you know, we roughed it out engineering-wise, and it looks like we can get about that many spaces. We'll know better when when we have access to it. So okay, thank you. Yeah, no, I mean that that's whether I missed it or simply hadn't come up before. Uh, no, that's I mean that's really very good news to hear because congestion with parking uh, and traffic down there is. It has long been talked about it being a very large issue when the restaurant comes in. So uh, I, I, this may be the first I've heard of it or or simply missed it before, but uh, very welcome news. So thank you for, uh, for uh, you know providing that answer. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. And Council House, we're going to go into executive session at the end of our meeting, and then we will uh, adjourn from there. Uh, any other members of the Council have any questions? Now, do any members of the public wish to ask a question or make a comment about this project? Mr. Horak, name and address for the record, please. Ed Horak, 5 Congress Street. Can you Questions? 
Yeah, so can you talk to me a little bit about the hours of operation that this project's going to entail? We get a lot of, there's a lot of noise that happens down here on a regular basis now in this uh, so-called quiet zone that exists along the track. And it happens all, you know, all hours of the night. The Keolis guys are in here banging away and um, it's very disruptive. So can you talk about how, what the hours operations look like and what you might do to, you know, make that uh, less of a burden on us? Yeah. Um, so uh, I think it's a little premature, but I, uh, and we're going to have follow-up conversations about that when we have uh, a contractor on board. Um, uh, it depends on the construction approach. Um, uh, either way, we're going to have to develop a traffic management plan with the city. Um, and part of that is, you know, when we can do the work uh, safely. Um, so uh, I think I'm going to have to defer answering that till we have a better idea of that, of what the work plan would, would look like. Um, but, uh, you know, ideally, uh, it wouldn't be a very long or disruptive um, or noisy operation. Um, certainly trenching a road can get loud, um, but we're, we're looking to avoid that if we can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horak. Good to hear, good to hear from you. Hope all is well. I mean, yeah, so is this a project that uh, would be done during the day or is it something that would get done at night? Um, we haven't decided that yet. We haven't decided that yet. Okay. Um, both are on the table. Um, and again, that, that uh, would uh, be th something that we would look at as we build out the work plan and the traffic management plan along with that. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Any other? Go ahead, Ed. No, I just said thank you, Paul. Oh, okay. Uh, any other members of the public wish to make a comment? Okay, hearing no further questions or comments, I'll close our public hearing. And if we're uh, comfortable taking a vote on this, I would ask Ms. Dixon for a roll call to approve. Okay, do you want, do we need a first and second or just a? I need a first and then a second, yeah. Okay. And then a roll call. Yeah. Motion. Make a motion to approve. Second. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Um, and a roll call. Okay. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Hausman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanti? Yes. And thank you to our presenters for being so thorough. Um, you know, that's really a first. The slide was great. <laughs> it, it, it helped people understand the project. And it's nice. So I, I like to ask this to everybody that comes before us from National Grid. The project hasn't been done yet, right? Correct. Well, National Grid tries to do that every night so often. Come before us to ask for approval after they've done the work. So this is great. <laughs> great process. Yeah. We um, prefer to, to, to ask first if we can. Great. Thank you. Uh, now we are going back to communications from his honor, the mayor, unless somebody wants to do anything different. Okay. Um, Ms. Dixon, I think we're on order number 166. Yes. Uh, order number 166. Dear Honorable City Council, I hereby reappoint subject to your review and recommendation, Mr. Mark Casey of 16 Chapman Street, Beverly, to serve as a trustee of the David S. Lynch Public Parks Fund. Mr. Casey's term will be effective until September 30th, 2024. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill. And please refer that to the Committee on Public Services. 167. Order number 167. Dear Honorable City Council, I hereby appoint subject to your review and recommendation, Mr. Richard Vincent to serve as the Greater Beverly Chamber of Commerce representative on the Parking and Traffic Commission. Mr. Vincent will fulfill the term of Greater Beverly Chamber Executive Director Leslie Gould on the commission. Mr. Vincent's term will be effective until March 1st, 2024. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill. And please refer that to the Committee on Legal Affairs. Order 168. Order number 168. Dear Honorable City Council, I am pleased to inform you that the City of Beverly Emergency Management Task Force has been awarded a 
$1,236,878 National Urban Search and Rescue Response System Grant from the United States Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. This grant funding will be used to support continued development, operations, and maintenance of the National Urban Search and Rescue capabilities at the Massachusetts Task Force One site in Beverly. The National Urban Search and Rescue Response System provides funding for 28 national task force staffed and equipped to assist state and local, government, local governments conduct around the clock search and rescue operations following a presidentially declared major disaster or emergency under the Stafford Act, e.g. earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, hurricanes, aircraft accidents, hazardous material spills, and catastrophic structure collapses. When deployed, these task forces support state and local emergency responders' efforts to locate survivors and manage recovery operations. Massachusetts General Law Chapter 44, Section 53A requires both city council and mayoral approval before any grant, earmarks, donations, or gifts to the city can be expended for their prescribed purpose. I therefore request the city council approve this grant by taking action on this matter at your meeting of the city council on Tuesday, September 28th, 2021. Thank you. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill. Um, and I know that Mark Foster is here, but let's start with our grant director, Catherine Barrett. Ms. Barrett? Thank you, President Guanci. This is the annual federal grant for our Mass Task Force One site up at 43 Airport Road. Um, and they do a fantastic job up there, as everyone knows. I'm going to defer to Mark Foster to say a few words about this grant and his operations and his team. So, Mark. I think you're muted. Mark, Mark. I'm muted. Mark there you go. Okay, now how's that? Test one, two, three. Good job. Our, our grant is funded through uh, what's called a cooperative agreement uh, funding, which we agree to. Uh, uh, this grant comes yearly in a cooperative agreement. It uh, <clears throat> pays for all of our, our training and preparedness. It's a preparedness grant. We also have another grant that's called a response grant, which pays separately when we go places, and that's a different grant. But this is the preparedness grant. It's a three-year grant. It's used three years so that uh, they can overlap. So if we have a, a project that may take more than a year to complete, we can uh, oops, we can uh, do that. Um, i trying to think what else I need to, to say. Go ahead. Any questions? I have uh, Mayor Cahill would like to say something. Mayor yes, Cahill? Mike. Th thanks, Mr. President. I just want to say, I'm not specific to the grant before you right now, but Mark is always very modest and very matter of fact. And I just want to point out for, for you folks and for people watching that the task force, the mass task force was, um, what's the right word, Mark? Mobilized. Mobilized yes. twice during Hurricane Ida. First 80, 80 members were dispatched down to Louisiana. And then a few days later, a smaller group, mostly because most of their um, equipment had, was, was with them in Louisiana, but then a smaller group got mobilized to New Jersey. So just the most recent examples of all the, the really incredibly important work they do from the local right up to the national to keep people safe. Oh, thanks, Mike. Uh, can, Councilor Feldman. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I was wondering in terms of the the amount of the grant, if that's in line with what we've received in the past or if it's been expanded and what was budgeted for, because you said it was an, an annual grant, because I know costs have changed and we've had the pandemic. So just wondering. This grant has been about the same uh, after 9-11. 9-11 went up significantly to be about a million dollars. And it's been consistently that way ever since 9-11. Uh, occasionally we get a little bump up and down, but it's not a lot. This year there was a little bit more because uh, there wasn't any travel last year, so they moved some money over from last year. But it winds up being about $100,000 a month, which we draw down and spend simultaneously. I mean, the city will put out 100, we take 100 down. And uh, yes, that's about the, uh, it's been the same almost for coming on 20 years now. Thank you. 
And thank you for all your hard work. You really oh, thank you very much. Really, we appreciate this. We appreciate your help. Uh, before we move on, Richard T, you can't have your campaign signs behind you if you're going to watch it on the meeting. Please put them down. Thank you. Uh, any other members of the council have any questions for either Ms. Barrett or Mr. Foster? Councilor Rand. Thank you. Um, just real quick, can you, um, Mr. Foster, can you just give me a sense of what the um, the training, like, trainings example of trainings and then maybe do you purchase equipment for preparedness sure. too this grant i think has about uh ninety thousand dollars we plan to spend on equipment purchases and that includes uh you know uh replacing our vehicles our vehicles start to get old so we have a vehicle we try to do one vehicle every two years or one vehicle a year if we can also our our um train equipment starts to uh mainly the issue we have is equipment just getting timing out. We have uh, air cylinders that have to be replaced every 20, every 10 years. We have some equipment that's, uh, our airbags all became their end of life at uh, 20 years. So there's about an equal amount that's replacing equipment that we just have that is, is timed out because of uh, the um, life of the equipment. And uh, then on training, we spend, we don't spend any money on training for people there's no time, meaning people train because they volunteer to come in. So we spend our training on mainly uh, the equipment used during training. Uh, we do feed them, <laughs> and but they do. Uh, so we pay a little bit for, for food and also new training props when we build a prop or if we uh, have to buy equipment to do the expense during the training. We do a, a major training every month on the third Wednesday of every month. Anybody wants to come up, you can come up. And I have not the third Wednesday, third Saturday. And um, this year we'll be going to Camp Ethan Allen, hopefully next month, for our annual Mobex, which we take the whole team. We move up to Vermont. We go there for three days and come back. And that simulates uh, a deployment so people can get their feeling for how to deploy. Wow, thank you. Um, so I I want to just ask you about that invitation. You said the third Wednesday of every month you do a I training. Know, third Wednesday is the training meeting, and that then on that Wednesday we determine we're going to do that Saturday. So it's the Got Saturday it. following the third Wednesday. It's kind of a weird deal, but that's the way it works. That makes sense. And are you saying that that anyone can go up and begin? Well, not anyone, but certainly anybody who's interested, I'll have them come as my guest, and we'll take you up there, and we'll show you what, what goes on. Okay. And then I think my last question is just that, is it, do we, so task force one is a state operation. So are we, do we accept this funding because we're, you're housed in Beverly? Well, actually it's not a state. <clears throat> we get no money from the state of Massachusetts. Okay. The money all comes to the city of Beverly. Okay. Um, we, we can use the equipment whenever we want within the city. The city owns the equipment. It's titled to the city, and uh, we have an agreement to go work for the federal government when we have to. We use all this equipment locally, if we have to, or in uh, we work for the state, or we can go um, nationally. Uh, it's kind of like we're like the national guard. Day to day, we're work in the city. We're here, and they give us a mission to go somewhere. They'll write a paperwork. They'll federalize. And we'll leave the state. We always cover the city. We also have a uh, an operation up called NIRAC, which is a self-funding where we have a bunch of equipment. I think uh, signboards you see around the city that say NIRAC. Yep. That's stuff that we might maintain. It's done by our task force also. That's great. Thank you so much. We're really lucky to have you here in Beverly and to uh, um, it's, it's amazing being here and answering those questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Council Wren. Uh, any other members of the council have a question for Ms. Barrett or Mr. Foster? Quick one for you, Mark. Uh, yes. I, know you've been, I know you've been doing this since at least 2000. When did you start? 1992. Well, as a team, we, uh, we filed for a grant with the city of Bev for the federal grant. The first time it came out was in 1992. We actually had accepted in 93. And I believe we got a charter from the federal government around 90, mid 93. And we've been doing it since 93. 
Good for you. Thank you for everything. Um, I would entertain a motion to accept the grant. So, so moved. Second. 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 And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Hausman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanci? Yes. Now let's move on to communications from other city offices and boards. Okay, number 169. Yep. The Honorable City Council, I am requesting the approval to have one day of early voting for the November 2nd, 2021 municipal election. Early voting will be Saturday, October 23rd, 2021 from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at City Hall, 191 Cabot Street, Beverly. Sincerely, Lisa Kent, City Clerk. Um, any questions or comments on this one? If not, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve Ms. Kent's request. So moved. Second. Roll call. Um, I just, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. President. I couldn't get yeah. my me going fast enough. I do okay. have a question, if that's okay. Of course. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, given the low turnout in the preliminary, and I know they're different animals, um, I was just wondering how you came to make this decision. Just wanted to pick your brain just in terms of it. It's not the Saturday before the election. It feels like, and just to try to understand how difficult it is to have early voting because it felt like we had such success with early voting last year. So just to understand where you're coming from. Ms. Dixon? Yeah, so I can try to answer some of that um, for Lisa, but um basically as far as we've seen and a lot of our colleagues and other clerks departments have seen early voting hasn't actually increased turnout um it is another option and it makes it more accessible for some people and easier but in the last elections where they've had it it didn't really increase the turnout that much itself um so that was we were trying to balance not having to hire too many extra staff with also, so doing a Saturday, our office can come in and staff it ourselves without being open to the public for other services like birth certificates and things like that. So we can focus on doing that um, because we don't get funding from the state for local elections. We only get it for state and presidential elections. So we are working within our own city budget this year. Um, and also I think the idea was that a Saturday might be a little bit easier for people who will work regularly during the week. Um, and then, as far as the Saturday before, typically for state elections, I don't know if you've noticed, but they we end the Friday before the election because we have to have time to print our books for check-in for election day. And we have there's a lot of packing and processing that has to go into getting everything ready. Um, and so usually like when there's been two weeks of early voting, say before the presidential, it would be for two weeks, but it would end the Friday before the Tuesday. That would be the last day, um, just to allow offices, clerk's offices to prepare everything to go out again on Tuesday, because we have to take in all the information and the ballots that were processed through early voting in person, and we have to package all of that and get all the data into our system so that it's ready to go on Tuesday. Thank you for that explanation. I, I appreciate sure. it. Um, and then the other piece of this that, you know, because I'm just, naturally one person who believes that we ought to make voting as easy and accessible as humanly possible. If it were me, there'd be tons of early voting. You know, it just, it's just who I am. But the other question that I have too is just about the election generally. Um, what is the city, and this can go to you, Ms. Dixon, but also to the mayor in terms of making sure that the words out there about the early voting and about all the ways we can vote and just about election day itself um just to try to make it more accessible and understood just across the city thank you sure so we actually try to keep the mayor out of that as much as possible because he is running um not that we don't try to keep him in his office in the loop but we um don't necessarily want him to be sending out those messages um but we have a new page on the website we put up this year, actually, that it's just 
under in a few spots you can find it i think on the learn more tab at the top it says elections and it's at the bottom of the main home page as well and it's also you can link to it from the clerks page but it says information about the upcoming election and we try to update that regularly with who's going to be on the ballot, how to ask for a vote by mail application or, or absentee ballot. Um, if, you know, as soon as, if this and the warrant get approved, we'll put those on probably tomorrow or Thursday this week, get those uploaded there so people can see them. And it kind of has a lot of the details as well as links to the Secretary of the State's website where people can check their voter registration status um, or there's some other options on their website of things that people can do or if they need to just update their address, things like that. Um, we have talked some to, I believe, Jocelyn and our IT department to see if we can get a banner on the website closer to the election. I'm not sure where we're at with that. I know we did that last year for the presidential. I can't remember if we did it for this uh, September primary last year or not. But uh, so we have talked about some of that. Um, I'm not that sure. Sounds, there that's other great. Things. That sounds yeah. very helpful. And I think a, a banner. Or, or something on the main page of the website just announcing the election and how you can vote is yeah. excellent. And I'm also just wondering, do you ever reach out? We have uh, Marianne Holak here on the line. Um, um, oh, that's great, Jocelyn. But, um, <laughs> thanks, Jocelyn. Do you ever reach out, say, to the um, Council on Aging? Yeah, so Lisa was actually the at the Council on Aging yes. today. <laughs> uh, yeah. So she went there today with some flyers of information, and she Good. brought a stack of uh, I know she brought a stack of vote by mail. She may have also brought a stack of voter registration cards. I can't remember. But she brought some paperwork to leave there as well. And I know Lisa has the um, the city clerk Facebook page where she also will post updates. You know, if there's maybe if there's a deadline coming up or something going on, you know, she'll post an update there for people who follow that. Good effort. Thank you very much for that detail. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Councilor Ames. Thank you, Mr. Good. Turkey. The banner will be up tomorrow. Great. <clears throat> Um, we had a first, we had a second, and now we're on a roll call. All right. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Hausman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanzi? Yes. And Ms. Dixon, great job answering those questions. Thanks. Uh, where are we now? We are on order number 170. <clears throat> okay, order number 170. Uh, this is for the 2021 warrant for the municipal election. Dear Honorable City Council, attached is the warrant for the above referenced election for your review and approval. Note that this follows previous warrants in a format provided by the Secretary of the Commonwealth's Election Division. Thank you. Sincerely, Lisa Kent, City Clerk. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. I would entertain a motion to approve Ms. Kent's request. So moved. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Hausman? Yes. Um, Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanzi? Yes. Order 171. Okay, sorry, this whole writing and reading at the same time thing, I'm still working on it. That's okay, you can write okay. right uh, Order number 171. Dear Honorable City Council, I'm asking for your approval to delegate responsibilities for answering the open meeting law complaint that was filed by Joseph Kane, dated September. 19th, 2021, pertaining to the City Council's September 13th, 2021 meeting to the City Solicitor's Office. Sincerely yours, Paul M. Guanci, Council President. And I think Jesse Dole was going to speak on this. Mr. Dole. Uh, thank you, Council President. Um, technically, under the open meeting law, uh, the, uh, the Council would need to actually vote, in, excuse me, actually meet in the executive session that's on the agenda tonight prior to actually um, delegating authority to um, respond to the complaint. So uh, my suggestion would be that we, we hold this till next Monday's meeting for an actual vote by the, by the council. Great, thank you, Mr. Dolan. We'll meet in executive session to discuss that further at the end of our meeting. Thank you. Okay, um, so we will hold that. Uh, order number 
Okay, order number 172. Oh, this is a communication from, I believe, the Senior Center. Yes. Um, okay, all right, so would you like me to read the whole letter? Uh, you could do that. And okay. then we'll, uh, Ms. Holak is here, so let's have a few comments from her at the end. Okay, sounds good. Dear Mayor Cahill, at the Council on Aging Board meeting on September 14th, 2021, we held a discussion about the American Recovery Plan Act, ARPA, and how this funding could support older adults who were ad adversely impacted by the COVID pandemic and its ongoing effects effect on their lives. We respectfully ask that you consider prioritizing the projects included herein as you move forward with funding decisions. So, uh, number one, support and fund programs that provide for access to healthy foods and housing options for older adults who are living in Beverly. Two, return program and office space currently used by the Board of Health to the Senior Center for prog programmatic and administrative use. As a board, we have been troubled by the loss of program space for use by older adults, uh, older adult participants, and we feel strongly that it's time to both return the space and refurbish it for senior center use. Funding will be needed for the refurbishment of this space. Three, provide funding for a housing outreach specialist to assist those needing to move to senior housing or other more affordable places as they are unable to afford the taxes on their single family homes or their rent in privately owned apartment buildings. Four, provide for funding to refurbish the dining room area of the senior center to allow seating for four instead of eight individuals and install more energy efficient lighting to make the space safer for those with low vision and those who are aided by canes and walkers. Uh, I, th I think the numbering, got, this says number one, but maybe number five, provide funding for building improvements at the senior center, parking lot, HVAC system, and lighting. These improvements could position the senior center to be more functional and accessible to the growing number of older adults in the community. Create the infrastructure for an age and dementia friendly community de designation by our AARP and the World Health Organization. This would allow for many of the services we feel are necessary to make Beverly inclusive for all ages to be implemented under one umbrella. This could include a handyman program, technology center, training opportunities for businesses that serve older adults, transportation for all ages, elder, an elder affairs office, similar to the school-based police officers. Consider funding a handyman program so that older adults living in single family homes could have an affordable means to make their homes safer as they continue to age in place. This would include working with the fire department or others to make sure every home has working smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Provide funding for a citywide technology center slash storefront so that all those who need assistance learning how to use their devices or get connected to the internet can be served. Coordinate city transportation services and or shift to an on-demand transportation model for all residents. Assign an elder affairs police liaison to support older adults with scams, abuse, self-neglect, driving, cessation, and other concerns of those aging in place in Beverly. We understand that Beverly as a large and diverse community has many needs and also many leaders and visionaries who wish to fund and support projects that will support the health of the community for many years to come. From our perspective, we also need to find and support those living among us today as they strive to achieve healthy aging that is affordable, accessible, safe, and fulfilling. Thank you for your consideration of our priorities. We would surely welcome an opportunity for more dialogue with you and your team. Sincerely yours, and it has the signatures of the members. Thank you. Um, Ms. Holak, an additional comment or two? Um, I um, I would just like to say thank you, um, Christine, for doing such a great job reading through that letter. Um, and also that um, thank you for uh, taking the time to hear from the Council on Aging Board. Um, they're a great group of people who have been very concerned about um, the well-being of older adults in Beverly, especially throughout the pandemic. And I think I, I, think I told you back in uh, at my budget hearing that we had opened 27 housing cases 13 of them reportable to elder um, to the elder abuse program um, back in the spring. And last Monday, we actually had three um, homeless individuals independent of one another show up at the senior center looking for help. Um, and so most of our staff time right now is being really uh, focused on the 
the basic needs of housing and food um, for many of the older people living in the community. And I, I think they're feeling very vulnerable to both the ongoing concerns around the, the uh, COVID Delta variant, um, but also, you know, what does the future look like for them in the city as, as we grow um, and try to support um, all ages? And, you know, as much as, you know, I think we all love our schools, we need to all love our seniors as well. And I do think that we need to be more intentional about how we're serving the older folks who live in Beverly. Um, the baby boomers have really, um, you know, come of age. And we've been predicting it now for a while, but um, our baby boomer population has come of age. and. Um, sadly, the homelessness situations we're seeing are in a younger population of older people, so the 60s and the early 70s. Um, and these people could live for 15 or 20 more years, God willing, maybe 30 years, and, and right now, today, they don't have a foundation to support them. Um, and we have wonderful community partners. I can't say enough about Sue Gabriel and her team at Bootstraps. Um, and, I'm hoping that some of this ARPA funds really goes to support their work as well. Um, but a housing specialist, even for the time that the funding is available, could really get us through this really tough time where people are struggling um, with finding new living arrangements. You know, people were evicted even during the pandemic when they weren't supposed to be. You know, landlords died, family members wanted their tenants out so they could renovate. Um, we've helped all kinds of people in all kinds of situations, um, and it, it just keeps growing. Um, and I, I think if we could get the funding for um, a handyman program, then we actually could have um, a housing specialist who would also be the person who could help people, you know, get their bathrooms handicap accessible, you know, help them find someone to put in a grab bar. Um, and I talked to Don Preston about this too, and he's already doing it in Danvers and in Peabody. So I just have to ask, why can't we also do this in Beverly um, for the people who live here? Um, and you know, you all know I'm passionate about the subject of older adults in Beverly, so I will be quiet now. Um, but I, I do thank you for for listening and and thinking about how we can be intentional in moving forward and helping seniors in Beverly. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hola. Councilor Ames. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your comments. I appreciate your letter. Um, of course, we all understand here that seniors um, took a massive hit during COVID, right? They, mm -hmm. Their lives were on the line. So this is a long list. And, you know, if I had it my way, we'd do it all. Mm -hmm. um, but I was wondering if um, you could speak to a couple of things. Number one were a couple of priorities mm -hmm. um, that you really feel are most important. So as these conversations move forward, we just understand where you're coming from. Sure. And the second is there's a lot in there about um, the space that the um, Board of Health is taking. Mm -hmm. And just to understand, we have the mayor on the line too. What did what the practical options are? Because it does feel like you are pinched, mm -hmm. but um, there are probably some practical realities to that too. So, and there might be some creative solutions moving forward as well. State, uh, Councilor Ames, I would say that, you know, we lost our, t our computer lab to the Board of Health over the pandemic. Um, and technology was one of the biggest concerns that we had with reaching older adults throughout the pandemic is their inability to access the technology that everybody else was using. We, we saw that with people trying to make, um, you know, talk about an ageist state decision to make all the vaccine appointments online appointments. Um, and older adults didn't have the capacity to make those appointments on their own, they needed help. And our staff was really able to help a lot of people get those appointments. Um, but now we, you know, we had a very small technology lab, but we had one and now we, ha now we don't. Um, 
we also, you know, had support groups that met in the space that the Board of Health has taken over. We had an older batters women's support group that met every week there. Um, we had um, um, an AA group that met there. Um, so it, it, it's just a, an all-purpose space that we, we lost. But I think about my friends at the Board of Health. I've loved having Bill Burke in the building with me. But, you know, we know the police lived, worked in and, and lousy headquarters for a lot of years, but I don't see that the Board of Health needs to do that if there's another option because their working conditions right now really are not adequate for their needs. Um, they, and, and, and it's pinching us too and being able to provide some services that we think we should be providing on site. Um, Thanks. And, our, and of that other list in terms of- the, Well, housing, well, you know, housing yeah. specialist, a specialist, an extra housing staff person, um, I think is really important, um, even if it is just for a time period of, you know, as long as the ARPA funds are available. Um, we can't do outreach because all we're doing is helping people fill out housing applications. And then they're finding out that the wait list is two years, you know, and, and so then it's what are they gonna do in the next two years when their landlord said, you know, I'm selling this apartment building and you need to move kind of thing. So um, we just, we've seen it all. Um, and the other thing we've seen is that seniors cognitive abilities have also declined over the pandemic. Of course, not everybody, some people have thrived, um, but other people have had problems with coming, coming back to driving, coming back to, you know, exercising, um, and just, you know, it's, it's hard to watch. Thank you, Councilor Ames. Um, I would entertain a motion to receive and place on file Ms. Holak's letter. So moved. Second. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Hausman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanzi? Yes. Uh, we have no communications, applications, or petitions, so let's move on to unfinished business from a previous meeting. That's order 143, Ms. Dixon. Do you have it or do you want me to read it? You got it. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is order number 143, a grant of $12,606,097 in American Rescue Plan Act from Massachusetts Ex Executive Office for Administration and Finance to help with COVID pandemic related needs. And I know that some members of the council wanted to uh, wait on this until after we heard, after the public meeting. Mayor Kale, do you want to talk about how that meeting went? I think it went well. I think it was it was it was the beginning of a conversation. Um, we received follow up from several different um, representatives of some of our local nonprofit stakeholder groups after that meeting, as as I requested. Um, so we've got some proposals and some thoughts to work with. Um, you know, speaking just for a minute to to um, what you were just looking at. Um, as, as I think you all know, this is a bit off topic for a sec, but as, as I think you all know, um, the next capital project after the police station has been meant to be the renovation of the old police station, which when complete will allow us to bring inspectional services and the health department back into uh, the city hall campus. You also know from spending time in city hall that even pre-COVID, the the crowdedness of some of our offices really hasn't lent itself ideally to, you know, to, to optimal work conditions and it's been even tougher with COVID. So, so that uh, renovation of the old police station is really job one. Um, one of my concerns with our health department is I haven't wanted to move them twice. Um, and, and the hope is that they'll, you know, their long-term home is going to be ready for them in two and a half, three years. Um, at the same time, and this does come back to, to ARPA funding, um, it's clear to us, and we've, we've talked about it at the public meeting, Mr. President, back to what you asked me to discuss briefly. 
at the public meeting we talked about it as well as in, in individual and smaller group conversations with some of you folks um, and that is that public health and how it's delivered um, is something that's really in need of, of reinvention and so it's clear that the model that most smaller cities and towns have used for quite some time isn't sufficient so you know we look at we look at some of the needs that have shown themselves and we'll need to be staffing uh, we'll need to be adding staffing to our health department some of that may be temporary as we address some of the you know direct um, and, and hopefully temporary impacts uh, of the pandemic but some of it may prove out to be longer term um, similarly um, Ms. Holak and I spoke this morning about an email she sent me yesterday and she referenced it she gave me several examples in that email yesterday of, of housing instability and concerns that seniors are bringing through the you know through the door at the senior center to the staff and it's clear that again some of this may be temporary uh, staffing needs and some of it may prove out to be longer term i would say as as our senior population continues to grow you know we're going to see some longer term staffing needs beyond what we've got in place so you know the the meeting itself mr president i think was a great start uh, in terms of the community weighing in and, and knowing that we want to hear more um on a number of number of topics um and i you know as, as i said to all of you and I've, I've tried to say to anybody who listened uh you know the the way this grant was um created legislatively it's the executive branch that makes those final decisions on expenditure but this is unique um this is something that none of us hope we experience again the, the need for this kind of federal money to come in this way and so it's my desire and i know mr ailes as well that there really are a number of kind of running ongoing conversations as we determine how best to utilize this money now in the coming months and over the next three and a half years and even longer because it, as as we know on on some of the capital front it's um it's obligation by december 31 2024 so there's this is really an ongoing effort and i think it, it you know it, it benefits the community and it really only makes sense that it be a shared conversation and, and and set of decisions the decisions have to be made at various points along the way i think i've also said and any one of you could say the same thing because you know it's it's human nature that not all decisions get made by acclamation or, or by consensus but you know it's it's our intent to be as as uh you know collaborative inclusive and transparent as we can be in, in how these decisions get made thank you mayor kale mm -hmm. um any other comments or questions before i ask from councillor ames no thank you um i was I, I do have a couple of questions. I'm glad to hear you speak to the department, the health department, because I think you're on point. I think um, the world has shifted, you know, and, and fortunately the city's received a decent amount of support from the state and the feds to try to get you through this. And um, I think that even just, even some, I know you hate to move them again, but even temporary, you know, office space, just to make sure that the Council on Aging is working as well as it can, is probably, a because um, it is an option because it's a hub of services. I was wondering if you had, when we sat down, you talked about, um, and you could have changed where you're coming from, somewhere around $8 million of this to be used sort of as, um, uh work uh <clears throat> not so much service related but more um you know on infrastructure are you still sitting in that place you're on mute mr mayor well oh, sorry about that yeah i just want to thank you for the first observation and then the question so let me take them in that order uh, what I what I meant to say and I forgot as I was just talking a couple minutes ago was we, we don't want to move the health department twice at the same time we have been looking at some space that um, that some of our police personnel have been in recently uh, and now no longer need 
for potentially moving, you know, one or two or, or, or of the health department employees to, to wholesale pick up the health department and move them doesn't make sense. But I think there can be hopefully some relief of some of that extra space they've needed to use that can be turned back to the needs of the seniors in coming weeks and months uh, if we're able to um, formalize using some other space that, that is not currently needed by, um, you know, we, we had, we had um, community impact unit um, and other folks in other spaces. So we're, we're looking at those. Um, and we've, I've already talked with Mr. Burke about some of that possibility. Um, and then to your question about the, how much gets spent programmatically, how much gets spent on infrastructure. I think the, the best way for us to look at it is we, we need to spend on program and services what we need to spend. And, and that'll only come clearer over time. Some things are showing themselves immediately. Um, will they need to be funded for three and a half years? Um, will, you know, will we find other needs as we go? Yes, I'm sure. Um, and I think so that maybe the, the best answer is we'll collectively try to determine what needs to be spent on services and programs and make sure we put that money to that effort. And then as much money as we can put to infrastructure, there's a lot of uh, eligible and appropriate infrastructure that needs attention. And I think that's really the best way to look at it. As much as we can put that infrastructure, we should, and as much as needs to go to programmatic needs and services needs to go. So that, that's part of why we don't want to spend it all in one fell swoop. You know, we want, we want to kind of take a look at what's needed in the near term, what may be needed projected out over three and a half years in a given department, um, make some infrastructure and spend expenditures in the near term, hold some back. So I think mean, it's it's just it's a man and, and Mr. Ailes is better than than anybody I know at, at, at managing that type of balance as well. Thank you. Um, I um, asked at the last meeting that you put on the city website how we had spent last year's dollars, and I looked up there today and I didn't see it. And in fact. I looked on the finance page and I didn't see a link to the 22 budget and I just saw a financial statement from 2014. And so I understand completely your desire to be, as you said, collaborative and transparent. But to my fellow colleagues, there are a lot of times where, I mean, the past two years, I haven't seen that. And I just have to say, I want to bring this money in. I want to bring it in fast. I want to have a collaborative process. But I honestly am just a bit concerned because I just think that as a government, our primary responsibility is to clearly explain how tax dollars are spent because we want to make sure that information is easily accessible to residents and businesses throughout the city and that's how we're accountable it's going to be our number one priority and i just feel as you know because we want people to be trusted with our tax dollars we want to make sure that people feel good about the way we spend things. And I just worry without our telling the story that the story can be told without enough useful information. And personally to my colleagues, I mean, if you just go to the Dan town of Danvers website and I encourage you to open a window and type in their um, financial summit, and they, they just Google Danvers Financial Summit and you can see a blueprint of how their goals and how they spend their money and how they spend their money, you know, across um, other, you know, compared to other communities. And when we look on page 22, they'll give you their financial expenditures per capita. They'll tell you exactly 
what the definition of that is. And then if you go to the total expenditures per capita by a whole bunch of communities, Burlington, Linfield, Andover, North Reading, Reading, Danvers, Peabody, Salem, Wakefield, Stone, Stoneham, and Beverly. We're at the bottom. And that's 2019. And I just, you know, worry. I just worry about the decisions that, you know, to my colleagues and the people at home, sometimes that what come out of this administration. I mean, and if you look at just a couple of the two, 2021 numbers, Beverly, we spent, and I went on the DLS website because I just didn't want to trust what Danvers said. In 2021, our per capita expenditures were 3908. Burlington was 53.32, Danvers was 47.12, Gloucester 46.70, Hamilton 46.52, Middleton 41.12, Peabody, which has had a heck of a time, was 34.82, less than us, and Salem at 41.64. And, you know, if you go back to their 2017 study, we're again at the bottom. And they even go into public safety. Public safety, we're at the bottom. Public works, we're at the bottom. And per pupil spending, this is 2017, we're at the bottom. And, you know, if you look at the state, we're below the state average. In 2019, the state average of spending per pupil was $17,547, and we spent $14,781. And I, I want to send this out. I want to get it done. Our teachers are paid less. The average teacher pay is 82 in the state. Our average teacher pay is 75. And I feel like the streets don't get paid, the sidewalks don't get fixed. A lot of the staff don't make living wages. And I just want to have, and we have tons of money. It's not like we don't have money. You know, in, in, 2000, in 2019, the, July, the June 30th cash report reported $70 million. In 2020, it was 81 and a half. And the, the, you know, if you look on the state website, the September, you know, the June report this year is due on September 30th. So I, I don't know how to fix this. I want this to happen. I want us to work together, but I want trash cans. And I want the Council of Aging to be okay. And I just believe that in this city, we don't spend enough money on us, on services. And I just, I'm almost out of here. You know, this is, but I think I just have to say once and for all, you know, my guess is that June 30th cash number will come in if it was 81 and a half, went from 70 to 81 and a half with the federal funds that it's between 88 and 95 million dollars and of course that's a snapshot it's the same snapshot as you would get from the covid numbers you know it goes up and down it's not but over you know the past 10 years it's it's steadily increased we have money but i just you know, I think we need more police officers. I think, you know, and so how these COVID dollars get spent and the decisions these this this administration makes, you know, I, traditionally for me, haven't added up to enough services for the people who live here. And like I said, I, I want this money in. And I'm happy to hear that you want to be transparent, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Cahill, and you want to be collaborative. But my question truly is, is how, if last year we didn't even get the numbers on the website? 
you know, it's a plea to my colleagues that accountability for all of us, we all serve, we're all elected, and it's accountability is the only way for us to move forward. You know, I, and it, it's not just in finance. I have no idea what the sustainability director that I supported or the, or, or the um, equity and inclusion Rams. director has done. I, I, I just want Mr. to- Mr. Rams, can I interrupt for a moment? You bet. I think you, you've made your point. You've gone on long enough and I, Councilor Copeland has been very patient. So can I you bet. move I'm on not... to him? Thank you. Councilor if Copeland? I, if I could, Mr. President. Oh, please, Mayor Kahle, I'm sorry. Yeah. Councilor Ames, I, I, I would love if, if you would share with me the graphs that you were showing. Um, because I do want to understand what you're um, speaking to. Um, and I've uh, shared this with Mr. Ailes from the beginning of when I was was elected. Okay, well, then I'll, I'll check with him and get a look at the graphs that you held up to the camera just then. Thank you. Uh, and I do want to say, when, when we met recently, and Mr. Ailes said it during budget, and when we went re met recently, we agreed that we would be trying to put some uh, some more uh, materials up for the public to see. I'm going to tell you that in the very near term, in the last month and a half, there have been some there have been some unavoidable severe shortages in the staffing in Mr. Ailes' departments. They are very short term; they're being remedied, but it has made it really impossible to to do more than try to just keep up day to day. Um, and that, that is very near term and, and it will, it is being remedied. Um, I'll also say and that's not necessarily directed um, or directly related to this, but in, in terms of recognizing the significant need for uh, ARPA fund management um, and the ability to, you know, to, to um, share out the information that we're all looking to uh, with the ARPA funds, Mr. Ailes has um, um, recommended and I've approved uh, bringing in uh, some temporary uh, temporary additional help in the office on the ARPA um, uh, management disbursement of the ARPA funds specifically. And that's um, an example of something that we want to put in motion and needs this council's vote uh, before we can can actually act on that. So, you know, just as an example. Um, and so, you know, look, we, we do want the same things, and I appreciate your passion on, on the, the, um, the, you know, the issue of sharing the information, and Mr. Eels has stated his commitment to doing so, and we just, we just need to get caught up and ahead of some things in the, in the combined finance departments to get there. So thank you. Thank you. Councilor Copeland. Yes, uh, thank you, Council President. And I apologize to everyone. I lost my uh, computer with the uh, the. Andrew Boyd. There you are. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Okay. Uh, so my, I just wanted to say um, thank you to um, uh, the mayor and Mr. Ells, because uh, last time we were here, I brought up that. You know, we had done the things that we said we would do before we would go ahead and authorize the funds. Uh, since then, you've, you've had the, the summit and the meeting with the counselors. And uh, the, the greater part of that is just to show that, you know, other people can get involved. And regardless of what decisions are made, your voices will be heard and your voices are important, uh, which for democracy is very crucial for us to move forward. Uh, and also, I think it allows us to identify some blind spots, just like we saw with the Council on Aging, uh, things that we might not have been thinking about before or, or had an understanding of, uh, so we get a better perspective on. So I, I just wanted to say, as far as that, I, I appreciate uh, you following through with that and that getting done, and I, I know there's more to come. Uh, and I also agree with, as we move forward, the transparency aspect of it, the more that we can do, uh, the better. But, but I just wanted to say thank you for completing that portion of it. And it's greatly appreciated. Thank you, Council Copeland. Council Houseman. Yeah, I'll just be uh, uh, brief. Uh, while I've been, you know, listening to the to the dialogue on the subject of, um, you know, transparency and and and, and collaboration, uh, I 
went to the town of, I have two computers set up, one that I'm using for this and one I'm using to, to follow documents uh, on another computer. Uh, so I went to the town of Danvers and they do have a very, uh, I would say user-friendly um, uh, set of, uh, you know, easy to find, find in, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, financial information, including their American Rescue Plan uh, funding table with, um, you know, project category and cost and uh, with an accompanied pie chart and color and so forth. So I obviously haven't had a chance to really look at this much uh, at, at all, uh, but it goes into uh, a fair degree of, of, of of, you know, fairly layman friendly ways of, of communicating information. So, you know, I, I think we're all on the same page. We really, as government, you know, officials, as elected officers, uh, we want to be able to communicate our decision making to the community. So um, I'm hopeful that as part of our expenditure of the ARPA funds, we do, in fact, um, hire whatever assistance Mr. Ailes and his department needs, and perhaps uh, including the IT department, specifically to allow us to, to get some of the information about this $12 million up on our website so that people can readily uh, you know, access it as a matter of, of transparency. So I, I, appreciate the, I appreciate the discussion and, and hope that one of our shared goals will be to really have that very specific uh, outcome as part of uh, the money that we spend. Thank you. Thank you, Council Osman. Council Flaherty. Uh, yes, I just want to talk to um, what Council Ames was talking about, and I do appreciate what uh, Council Hausman talked about. Um, I put it better than I could, but I don't think it's a lack of transparency. Um, someone's trying to hide something. Um, I heard the same thing in the scale in the uh, days that we're trying to hide something and not be transparent. Um, to me, the city looks like it's with our bond ratings and the city's doing well. I mean, um, I think we have a pretty good city. People want to go to our school system. So I don't think I want to, I don't want to put it out there that uh, as a city, uh, the administration or the council is trying to hide something or be tr not transparent. Um, you know, especially with uh, our budget analyst, um, with Kathy Griffin before, and now Mr. Perry. Um, we have a pretty good watchdog to make sure that the, um, the city is functioning well. Um, you know, that being said, uh, you know, what Council Ames talked about with teachers being not highly paid is enough compared to other cities and towns. Um, some of that is true information and in, in, in how do we get to uh, collectively, how do we get um, city uh, employees paid equally to or better than other communities? Um, but it's not necessarily on a black and white piece of paper. Um, there are reasons uh, for that. Um, and it, it maybe it's best to talk about it as we move forward as Council Ames won't be here. I won't be here. Council, Mr. President won't be here. Um, but I just want to, you know, let people know that um, the city is well run. Um, and yeah, there are some money out there that um, that we have um, for a rainy day fund or for to make the city a, a better city. And we have spent some of that money down in the past years. Um, but I don't. I, I get a little uncomfortable when I, you know, we talk about transparency. Um, you know, I think this administration, the past administrations have been. And again, with the watchdogs that we have with our budget analysts, um, we do a pretty good job. That being said, we can do a better job and um, we can do it in a collective way because um, I think Mr. Ailes does an outstanding job and to say something's not on the website when it was supposed to kind of thing. Um, and I, I'm not particularly worried about that. Um, I know we, if we can do it together, I mean, you say hiring I, some IT work might help, um, but it's not always apples to apples when you compare some of those budget sheets to the town of Danvers to other communities, because quite frankly, I wouldn't want to live in those communities. Thank you. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Council Feldman. Yes, thank you. Um, I I had I have a lot of um, a lot to echo what um, Councillor Flaherty just uh, mentioned, but in looking at um, some of the points that Councillor Ames brought up, I really I really do think it's kind of apples to oranges, and you can you can find statistics to prove to back almost any point um, on either side of any argument. And I really, I don't like um, in a vacuum without context, comparing ourselves budgetarily to other communities. That being said, 
I do like the idea of taking ideas that are good in terms of what other communities do um, in getting the information to their constituents. And I, I agree that I, I don't feel it's a lack of transparency. I feel like a, it's a lack of staffing um, because the answers have always, everyone's been, when I've asked the right questions, the answers have been always very clear and clearly communicated to me, but it's just, we don't have the staffing and capacity to put this information in a user-friendly format. And I would, I would hope that if we are looking to, I would echo what Councillor Houseman had said about, if we're looking to um, incorporate staffing in, in finance, in the finance department to make the ARPA funds into a more user-friendly um, format to, to disclose this information to the public, I would hope that we um, continue to build a position like that or at least the capacity for that office to be in the budget going forward so we can always be able to do this and always be able to put something up annually that can be a little more user friendly and i know that that takes capacity in terms of staffing but that is definitely something that i think would make our city better and make and be really helpful um, in terms of lifting the burden that it's not it's not transparency it's you know it's lack of capacity i think is the bigger the bigger issue and help us communicate also as counselors it would help support us because i end up answering these questions piecemeal and i at least i do have i have an accounting background so i can i can kind of put this these things together um but it would be really helpful if we had a cohesive um, image document and place to point to that we all were on the same page. So, thank you, Council Feldman. Council Husband again. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be brief. I, I I I don't want to get hung up on the semantics. When I'm talking about transparency, I'm talking about communication. So, to Councilor Clarity's point, I don't think anyone's hiding anything, but the fact the fact is we have a relatively new website and the website apparently was not constructed around uh including in it as sort of a, a default function uh being able to put up our financial documents in a, a layperson sort of user friendly way to simply communicate so when i talk about transparency it's simply communicating to the public information that I, I think it's very reasonable to say they should have uh which is something you know very user friendly for the lay person to understand uh, you know whether it's a pie chart or you know wh whatever uh just a very basic layout of financial information that presently we simply don't have on our websites so that's that's really what i'm talking about i'm certainly not suggesting anyone's trying to hide information it's a matter of of, of good communication uh, which I think is just fundamental to being able to uh, ha have the trust of the public in, in, in what we do. And, and you know, I, I'd be hard pressed to find someone who will sing the praises of Mr. Ailes higher than, than I will. I recognize the, the, the challenges he has in his office from a staffing point of view. Um, uh, but with all due respect, I think this has been a, a long term conversation we've had. Uh, and so I am looking forward to uh, hopefully having. Uh, applying funding that, that helps us address it. Thank you. Uh, anybody else to wrap things up before I ask for a motion? I would entertain a motion to accept the grant of $12,606,097 uh, from the American Rescue Plan Act. So moved. So second. And a roll call, please. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Flowers? Hausman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanzi? Yes. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Uh, motions and orders? Um, so we have number 160. 
be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Beverly as follows in the year 2021, an order amending an ordinance entitled Chapter 270, Vehicles and Traffic, amending Chapter 270, Vehicles and Traffic, Section 41, parking prohibited at all times by adding the following street segment. Pleasant Street, south side in front of number 36 Pleasant, extending to Hardy Street. And this was published Friday, September 17th. And this would be the final reading. Uh, Councilor Rand, this came from you and Councilor Flowers. You're comfortable with moving forward? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the second reading of this ordinance. So moved. Second. And a roll call. James? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Hausman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanci? Yes, thank you. Ms. Dixon, do we have anything coming out of committee this evening? Uh, I believe we have at least two. Let me double okay. check here. So we have 151, which was in legal affairs. Uh, this is the reappointment of a constable, Mr. Christopher P. Chies. Okay, I would entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Hausman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. Yes, Mr. Chigas has been doing this for almost 30 years, so we're comfortable with that appointment. And what else, Ms. Dixon? Uh, we have number 154, which is coming from Public Services. So this is the Council President appointment of Ms. Amy Benjamin to the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, I would entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Hausman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanci? Yes, and we wish Ms. Benjamin uh, the best in her new appointment. Great committee to be on, especially if it's your first committee you've ever been on. Uh, Ms. Dixon, is that all we have other than executive session? Yes, it is. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I am going to ask for a motion to go into executive session to let the public know as we will be adjourning from, uh, we'll adjourn our meeting, go into executive session, and we will not be coming back out into open session. Mr. Dole, does that sound correct? Uh, uh, Council President, if you could just, you'd act, actually have to read how it's worded from the agenda. Oh, right. That's what I'm going to do. But yep. am I going in the right direction? Yes. Okay. Um, I would entertain a motion to go into executive session pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Subsection 21A1, Purpose Number 1, to discuss a complaint against public officials, specifically an open meeting law complaint by Joseph Kane dated September 19th, 2021, pertaining to the City Council's September 13th, 2021 meeting. So moved. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Hausman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanci? Yes, and Mr. Dole, I'm correct. I don't have to adjourn this meeting. I can do it from executive session? Correct. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Best part of the meeting, of course, was the resolution for uh, the American Legion team. Uh, it's nice that uh, Manager Levine invited us all to the banquet, which is November 20th, and we're in the, in the works to get them marching in the – uh holiday parade on sunday the 28th so all good so councils you'll go to your additional link to get into executive session
Our next full city council meeting will be Monday, October 4th, which is next Monday. Thank you, everyone.